Welcome to our exam strategies workshop. I'm Kalina. I'm the academic advising grad assistant for the Mustang Success Center. And I'm here with Kara, one of our advisors. I'll give her some time to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Super excited to be with you. Like she said, my name is Kara, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm an academic advisor with the Mustang Success Center, and I'll be helping Kalina out with this presentation. Thanks, Kara. And like I said, we're so excited to be here to present this workshop. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a lot to cover today. So we're just going ahead and jump right into our agenda as people are still joining. Yes, perfect. So today we are really going to start off with what is test anxiety, because that's a really common thing that brings a lot of us to this space. We're going to talk about that pre-test preparation because that's so important. We're definitely going to cover some um, really helpful specific strategies for both essay tests as well as more of the objective tests that you see for all different subjects. Um, some really helpful strategies there. We're going to talk about the importance of a post test analysis and what that means. And we are going to kind of wrap up with this conversation about self care and self talk because that's a really influential piece to this as well. We will close up with a post survey that's really important. We'll give you some of the resources we talk about today. And then we will have time for Q&A after we dismiss folks. So if you have specific questions, feel free to submit them via the chat. And we, we can take a look at those afterward. But we're going to kind of breeze through everything today and stop for questions at the end. Now, we are going to be um, doing some activities to get you all involved, but you don't have to necessarily unmute. It'll all be online, which is great, but please participate because that's really going to help this conversation move along. Um, and remember, this is a professional class environment space. So be respectful, um, be responsible in your engagement today. And like I said, if you need anything, um, I'm monitoring the chat. So before we dive into the actual strategies for taking tests, we wanted to take some time to sort of reflect on where we all are in terms of our feelings about taking tests. So around this time, a lot of students might be starting to feel some level of test anxiety, which can come in the form of um, pressure or fear about taking exams. And there's many different components to test anxiety that we're going to discuss later. So physical, cognitive, and emotional components. Um, and there's many different assessments that have been developed to measure test anxiety. Um, the questionnaire that we're about to take together does focus on the cognitive component, but you can find other assessments that sort of touch upon different aspects of test anxiety as well. And I will be honest, when we talk about test anxiety, I have presentation anxiety as a professional. So you are not alone here in this space. Um, I definitely struggled with test anxiety. And one of the things that's really helpful is at least just knowing what does test anxiety feel like for you? How do you experience it? Because that's going to influence how you're going to manage it. So often there are some key symptoms that we can acknowledge within ourselves. Definitely some physical symptoms, sweating, shaking. That's one for me. I get very shaky and jittery. Um, rapid heartbeat for sure. So I do some breathing exercises to help with that. Dry mouth, fainting, nausea. Some of these are significant. So you want to know how this expresses itself physiologically with you, but you also want to be aware of the emotional undercurrents to it. So low self-esteem is one that's really common that I think we all face in our own ways. Maybe some anger or even some frustration with academics or just things going on in life feelings of hopelessness. This is one we hear a lot as advisors, distress, depression. And then like Kalina has been saying, there are those cognitive and behavioral pieces as well. So fidgeting, I like to click pens. That's the thing that I do. Um, avoiding tests or wanting to avoid that prep or whatever. Forgetfulness is a big one we see. I saw it on the Jamboard. Self-doubt and negative self-talk. These are all really big things. And once you start to notice what is being expressed, then you can start to target it a little more effectively. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. So in the chat, I'm gonna link um, another page that lists out some more. If you're identifying with some, maybe not others, take a look, it's a pretty helpful resource. But let's also talk about the causes of test anxiety because it may manifest itself, but we wanna figure out what's underneath this. And like I said before, and um, with the previous slide, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are kind of the main three that come up for folks. So number one is poor past test performance. So if you don't feel like you're a good test taker um, or you've struggled with certain tests in the past, maybe you got that first midterm back and it wasn't very good, likely you're going to feel a little bit more anxious for that next test. Um, 
lack of test preparation is a big one. So if you aren't preparing enough, you don't have that study time or time management really narrowed down yet, then you might also feel ill-prepared and anxious when you get to the actual exam. Uh, that was me a lot in college. And then a big one really is fear of failure in very broad terms or very specific terms. So um, a lot of folks tie some of our self-worth to our performance on tests or in our classes and our grades. Or maybe there's some perceived or real social pressure with your peers or even with your professors, someone you wanna um, impress. These are kind of the main three that folks experience with test anxiety. Now, we're not gonna to focus too much on the causes because likely for some of us, it's really easy to identify, but we're gonna talk about that test preparation very specifically because that's an easy one to build into our systems and, and really build as a strength. Um, and that way you can deal with some of those other pieces outside of spaces like this. All right, and so before we get to the actual mechanics of studying, it's important to think first think about the space in which you are studying. So research has shown that students tend to do better on exams when they've studied in an environment that mimics or simulates the testing environment. So you've probably heard a lot of these tips before, studying in a tidy and a space with good lighting, and also somewhere that's very quiet with um, less distractions as well. And this is a big reason why, especially if you have in person exams, because it's likely that your testing environment will be very similar to this. So studying an environment like this could also alleviate test anxiety as well, because it can help you become familiar with the sensory cues, which can also help with being able to recall information as well when you're testing in an environment that's very similar to the environment that you studied in. And having study groups can also be effective as well, depending on your preferences. Personally, for me, I've tried studying in groups in the past, and I've just realized that what works best for me is to study on my own and just like being able to take it at my own pace. But I know for a lot of people, having study groups is really helpful to have other people to bounce your ideas off of and get clarification on certain things, um, and also to be able to explain the material to someone else as well, because that can help you realize um, the gaps in your knowledge. And the note that I want to make about this is it's important to be selective about your study groups as well. So um, be very intentional about it. Pick people who you think will actually benefit your studying rather than take away from it. And I would also encourage you to not hesitate to reach out to people to study. I've seen that a lot of students do want to find people to study with, but they're often reluctant to actually reach out to their peers um, and find people um, to create that group with. And so with that, I also wanted to do a quick plug for a resource from our Academic Skills Center, which is study sessions, which is basically, um, you know, uh, tutoring and um, groups group study sessions for certain for specific classes on campus. And so this is a great resource to check out if you're looking to connect with some peers who are taking the same classes as you. Um, and these groups are also led by an instructional te teaching assistant as well. So it's a great way to get practice with your peers and also to get clarification on homework and just um, extra material that will supplement the content that you're learning in your classes. So Carol will put the link for those study sessions in the chat as well. And all the instructions to, um, to sign up for them will be on that link if you're interested. And so before studying for a test, these are some questions that you wanna ask yourself to help guide your studying. So first, what kind of test is it? Is it a written test? Is it a multiple choice test? Who will be writing the test and who will be grading the test? How much time will you have to complete the test? and what topics might be covered on the test. I wanted to bring extra attention to the second part of this slide, which is who will be writing and grading the test. Because your instructor and your TA will do their best to design a test that is supposed to be objective and accurately you know, measure your comprehension or knowledge of the material. But at the end of the day, they are human. And so their biases will play into the way that they write and grade the test. So that could influence what content they choose to include on the test and sort of what things they look for when they're grading as well. And a good way to sort of assess this and be mindful of it is to pay attention to the patterns of how they've graded exams or assignments in the past and sort of what things are, are they more strict on, what sort of feedback that they give and what they pay most attention to. So being mindful of that can help you um, 
decide what are some things that you should pay attention to when you do the exam or check for. So the next piece, I'm going to include a link in the chat. I actually just pulled this up. Um, this is the study cycle. If you need help structuring your study time, this is a really helpful tool if you want to check it out. I always recommend it to students, but a big part of it is reviewing. Like Kalina said, what do I know? Um, some of those details with the exam and a big part of preparing is going to office hours, connecting with your professors and learning directly from them. Um, in the meantime, we are going to transition into talking about some tips and pointers for different types of tests. So we are going to start off with essay and or written response tests. And because of our limited time together today, we won't be able to cover all the important strategies for all the different types of exams. So this part of our presentation would just give a very basic overview of how to navigate these tests. But you can find more information on the study strategies library from our academic skills center, which we will share with you at the end of the workshop. All right, so here are some tips and pointers that you can keep in mind as you're reading the prompts for an essay or a written response test or even just like an assignment. So it's important to, of course, read the prompts carefully and ideally you want to read the prompt multiple times as well just to catch anything that you might have missed the first time around. And as you're reading through it, underline some keywords that could give you um, indicators as to what you're being asked to do in the prompt and also what topics that the prompt will focus on. And as you're underlining these keywords and getting a better feel of what the prompt is asking, list any relevant material down just that comes to your mind. So sometimes we refer to this as a brain dump as well. So just anything that you can recall um, that's related to the prompt or could help you answer the prompt, just go ahead and jot that down just so you don't forget. And once you have all the material down that you might want to talk about, it'll help you sort of construct a brief outline and organize those different pieces together and decide which pieces you want to focus on when writing your prompt. Um, but you know, like if you, as you're writing your prompt and you feel like you want to take a different direction or want to bring in some more examples, you still have like that list of all the material that you can pull from as well as reference. So I wanted to do a quick example of keywords to pay attention to when you're reading an essay prompt. So I have two prompts on the screen right here. So the first one says, describe the changes in human communication within the last 20 years. And the second prompt says, comment upon the changes in human communication within the last 20 years. So if you notice these two prompts are the same, but the only difference is that the word at the beginning is different. So the key word that's telling you what you need to do. And so the first one, if it's just asking you to describe, most likely they're just asking you to lay out and basically tell all the changes in human communication that you observed within the last 20 years. Whereas in essay prompt two, um, with comment upon, that's usually an indicator that they want you to take some sort of subjective standpoint on it or have an opinion or argument about it. So it's pretty unlikely that the second essay prompt would be written only as it is. Um, usually the prompt will be longer and more specific about what kind of position they want you to consider. Like for example, in this one, what about human communication do they want you to have an opinion about? But this is just like a very basic example making notes of these keywords is still important to just get a sense of what is being asked of you. And with that, we wanted to share a resource. Um, this is from the University of Minnesota. It's basically a list of keywords that show up in different writing prompts and also descriptions of what those keywords are asking you to do. Um, so Carol put the link to the full chart in the chat, um, but I would say don't stress about memorizing all of these keywords and everything that it's asking you to do in detail, because like I said earlier, usually prompts will be more explicit about what they want you to do. Um, and also a lot of these keywords also ask for similar things as well. So, um, but it would still be helpful to just read through it a few times just to get a feel for them and seeing what sort of keywords are, are similar or have overlap. Yes. So once we've done some of that interpreting, we have an idea of what's being asked of us, we need to start organizing our essay response. And so the big key thing is start with the wording that you're given. Use part of that prompt to start your response. And we'll give you an example of that in a second. But that way you're being very clear, very direct and communicating to your professor that you know what you're talking about. Even if you don't feel like you do, it can sometimes give you that little bit of confidence, which is nice. 
you've created an outline hopefully at this point. So use your outline as a reference. I remember sometimes I would get into essay prompts and lose my train of thought. So it was helpful to go back to some of those key points or key phrases to restructure and find my place again in the prompt. And then it's a good idea, just like a normal essay, to include maybe an introductory statement and a closing statement at the end so that everything feels complete and tied up and makes sense. So we have an example of this so you can see what this looks like or hear what this looks like. So the example described the changes in human communication within the last 20 years. It may feel clunky or cliche, but it really is smart to start with something like these. You would say changes in human communication with the last 20 years include, that's a great opener. You summarize some of your main points from your outline, and then you can get into each of those and close it together. Or another example, human communication has changed within the last 20 years by means of, you provide a little summary, and then you can get into the details. And that way you get those big points out. And then as you remember some of those other details, you can move forward. Now, some people like to start things in different ways with a hook or whatever, and that's okay. But you wanna have a strong opening. Starting with the prompt though is really helpful because sometimes the prompt is more complex than this. And there are multiple prompts or multiple questions, multiple descriptive words. So if you can include those pieces, consistently, then you know that you're on the right track there. Now, that's just very brief with essay responses. There's a lot, but we're going to dive into objective tests next, because this is what a lot of us are dealing with as well, uh, especially in some of our STEM courses or otherwise. These are usually the bulk of the exam. So these general tips that we have are just some of the basic ones. Clean is going to get into some really specific ones after this as well. But in general, you always wanna know how many questions are on this test, how, many, how much time do I have? So you can estimate how to process that time well. I know some people I've heard, it's like 50 questions in 50 minutes, and that's a lot. So some of these other tips might help. You wanna think about though, are there penalties for guessing? Most often there's no penalty for guessing, right? So you want to guess if you don't know the answer. I'll share a very quick little story. I did not used to guess. If I didn't know something and I really couldn't figure it out, sometimes I would leave things blank on exams. And I had a professor talk with me and say, you should not do this <laughs> because you're robbing yourself the chance to get something right with a well-educated guess or just a random guess. So what I started doing was I would guess and then I would write, if I could write on the exam, I would write why I chose that option. And every once in a while, a professor would give me partial credit, which was really cool. So I got more points than just getting a zero for that question. So always guess. Read the question and answer it in your mind first, and then look for that matching answer, because sometimes that just reaffirms, okay, I do know this. And you have that little confidence boost. Answer the easy items first, so that you get that maximum number of points before you get too stressed out. And it helps, again, build that confidence as you go to those more difficult questions. But also sometimes you can use that question that you knew to answer something you don't know. Mark questions that you don't know and come back to them, return to them when you have more time. And only change your answer if you feel like there's a real reason to. Maybe you remembered something really important that you studied. Great, change it. But research really does indicate that three out of four times your first choice was probably correct. So stick with it. Don't second guess yourself too much. And don't waste time reviewing answers that you're confident in. If you are confident, trust your answer and move on so you use that time wisely. Yeah, thanks, Kara. And uh, like I said, we're going to be focusing on multiple choice questions in this section because most objective tests include these types of questions. Um, this is probably the most common type of question that you all are going to encounter. Um, but the study strategies library that we're going to share with you all later does include strategies for other types of questions on objective tests as well, such as fill in the blank or true, true or false questions. So if you know your exam is going to include those, I definitely recommend checking those out. And so let's say on a multiple choice test, you're stuck and you have no idea whatsoever of what the correct answer is be should be. Um, so Karis, as Kara mentioned, it's good. If there are no penalties for guessing, it's good to guess anyways to sort of maximize your number of points. But even in guessing, if you have the time, you can still be strategic about it. So these are some tips and pointers that I wanted to um, highlight that could give you a clue as to what the correct answer might be. So a lot of the times, the correct answer is likely going to be the option that's 
the longest or the most detailed. So if the test writer put you know, a lot of effort into making that answer choice like very detailed, it's likely that there is something that's right about it or it could be the correct answer. Um, so that one is pretty self-explanatory. And for the next one, if the, if the answer options are numerical, usually you can eliminate the extreme ends of the answer choices. And so for this question right here, for example, we can eliminate C and D because they are the lowest and the highest numbers on here. And then you can just choose between the middle values. So 15 and 32. Um, and in this case, B would be the correct answer if anyone was curious. And also the correct option is likely not going to be one of two options that are the same. And so in this problem right here, if we look at B and C, they are basically saying the exact same thing, just using synonyms or words that um, are similar to each other, but the meaning is still the same. And so if there are two, if you run into two options like that, that are the same, most likely you can eliminate both of them and neither of them are the correct answer because the correct answer would not show up twice uh, in the same question. And so you could just choose between um, two of the other ones. And on the flip side, the correct option is usually is likely to be one of two options that are lookalikes but different in meaning. So I wanted to bring attention as to how this is different from the previous example that I gave. So in the previous example, the meaning of the of the answer choices were the same. It's just the way that they were being described was different. Um, but what I mean by one of two options that are lookalikes but different is referring to the meaning. So in this one right here, two of the answer choices are nephron and neuron. And so they sound very similar, but the meaning behind them is different. So usually if a test writer is including both of these options on here, they might be trying to trick you or wanting you to or it might be important for you to be able to distinguish between the two. So it's likely one of them is going to be the correct answer. And similarly, the correct answer will be, might be um, in two choices that have frequently occurring elements. And so in this one right here, the following language are, languages are spoken in the Comoro Islands. B and D are similar in that they both include French. So we see French appear in both of them and they're distinguished by one, includes Arabic and the other one includes English. So this is kind of similar to the example that I just gave before in which two answers are similar, but there is a fundamental difference between them that the test writer might be wanting you to be able to distinguish. So it's likely that um, the, an the correct answer choice will be one of these two options. And the last tip that I have for this is the correct answer can also be one of two opposite options as well. So in this example, the planarian has, and then we see A and D are, are complete opposites of each other. So an anterior brain versus a posterior brain. And like I said, from a test writer's perspective, if they include both on here, then it's pretty likely that they want you to be able to tell the difference between them um, and trying to trick you in that sense. So um, you can eliminate the other two and try to pick between these two that have opposite meanings. There are other cues in the questions that could give that could indicate to you what the correct answer might be. So pay, definitely pay attention to the grammatical agreement, whether they use a versus an. So for example, in this one, um, the the stem or the end of the question ends with an an, and so it's likely that the answer will start with a vowel. And usually test writers do like catch this and try to try to like not give that away so easily, but it's still um, worth a shot to try to pay attention to that. And the other one as well is also singular or plural indicators. So whether they use is versus are. And in this example, the question includes are, so it's likely that the answer will be plural. And the note that I wanted to make about this is that you should still eliminate any answers that you know are incorrect for sure. And like I said, these are just tips and just based on common patterns, but they are not you know, telling you exactly for sure what the correct answer will be. So even if um, you find answer choices that fall under one of these categories, if you know it's incorrect, eliminate it. Um, and you should you know, you should be depending more on like your knowledge rather than just these um, 
these tips and they should be these strategies should be used as a last resort under the assumption that you don't know the answer at all. So some other final tips that I have for multiple choice questions avoid absolute indicators such as only always never everyone no one there it's very unlikely that something will be true in all cases or never true at all and so if you see any of these in your answer choices it's likely that it's not going to be the correct one and for questions with an all of the above options if you know two or more of the options are correct it's likely going to be all of the above even if you are unsure about that third that third answer or um, any of the other options and also, as Kara mentioned earlier, sometimes the answer in one question can be found in other questions on the exam. And this is also why it's helpful to do all the easy questions first and do everything that you know, because sometimes later questions might jog your memory or give hints for the questions that you weren't sure on. All right, and now I'm going to go into talking about the post test analysis so things that you want to reflect on once you've completed the test or once you've gotten your grades back for the test. So after you've taken the test, think about the way that the test was written. So what types of questions were asked and where did the material come from and what I mean by this is did the professor pull material from the mainly from the textbook from the lecture slides um, back in undergrad I have personal experience with this I noticed that some professors like they would assign a lot of textbook material but um but those are mainly used to be like supplemental or additional material to help clarify things that you don't know but for the actual exam they don't actually pull material from the textbook a lot and i've had professors who just pull material directly from the lecture slides and so paying attention to that and knowing where the professor gets the material from can help guide your studying and help you identify what you should focus on the next time um, you take the exam for the same class. And of course, celebrate what you knew, give yourself a pat on the back for um, being able to answer the questions that were easy to you or that you could remember. And reflecting on what questions did you miss and do you know how to answer those questions differently now and if you are unsure about anything i definitely you know recommend debriefing and asking to review your exams in office hours with your professor so earlier we talked about you know utilizing office hours before the exam but also utilizing office hours after the exam could be really important as well and really helpful um, and so not all professors will distribute your exam because they might not want them circulating around but most of the time you should be able to ask to like view them personally in their office hours. So I definitely encourage you all to take advantage of that. Um, and in your office hours, you could discuss any questions you did not understand and sort of go through them with your professor. Okay, so we've taken our exams or maybe we haven't, maybe you have some exams coming up. It's really important to focus on your self-care. It's so easy to get caught up in studying and all of the kind of panic with exams, but self-care is super important. So I won't harp on this. Hopefully you know this by now, but number one, sleep is the most important thing that you can focus on. Do not pull all-nighters. It is not good for your brain and it's not going to help, honestly. Your brains are on overload as they're taking in so much information and trying to be social and they're also still growing. So you need sleep so that you can rest, but also while you sleep, your brain actively transfers what you're studying into your long-term memory. So sleep is super important. Take naps if you need to also. Nutrition, do not guzzle all of the coffee and all of the energy drinks. Make sure you are hydrated, your brain needs water, but also don't give up coffee if you usually drink it. Find a balance with your nutrition. Complex carbs are really good so that your brain has that fuel, as well as healthy proteins and fats. Your body needs that as well. Chew gum. Sometimes that's really helpful for stimulating your brain like 20 minutes before an exam. Fun little tip there. Physical activity, if, especially if you're studying for a long time and just sitting in your room or on your bed or whatever. Actually, you shouldn't be in your bed, but get up, walk, take a break, go outside for five or 10 minutes. You would not believe what that can really do for your body and your senses. And really the key here is finding balance. So study in blocks or chunks of time rather than trying to do long, long, long cram sessions, because again, it's just not proven to work. So you want to use that space in between your study sessions, maybe start with, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes, maybe an hour or two, but take breaks. Don't sit on your phone. 
rest your senses and your eyes as you need to, but, you know, take care of food, whatever you need to recharge, do something fun for yourself, come back to it when you need to. Here's a tip too. If you're struggling to get started with studying, set a timer for five or 10 minutes and really sit down and try and focus. If you can push past that five or 10 minutes, typically you'll be fine. If it's not working, step away, take a break and come back to it in a little bit when you're better able to. Now, the other piece with this is self-talk. Our self-image and some of those mental or emotional things that we talked about before are really important. So as you're going through this testing season in the next few weeks, number one, reflect on your past successes. One bad exam is not all of your story. You have likely pushed through something really hard like this before. I could tell you my story about missing an entire midterm and working my way up from an F. We all have those moments and they're really formative. So think about how did you get through those hard things before? Draw on that success and you'll be okay. Hold your concern at a distance. Don't reflect intention or internally on some of these things. Like I'm not good at tests. Testing is just something that you can learn to be better at. So maybe you just reframe that. Tests are challenging for me. That's honest. We know what to do with that though. We can prepare for that. Think about things bigger though. Again, sometimes it's really easy to get sucked into the details, but zoom out again. The test is ultimately not a reflection of your self-worth in any way. And some of us really need that reminder. This test will also not probably determine your long-term outcomes. Yes, it can influence your success in the class. Yes, it can influence your major maybe, or some of those things, but you can still find success outside of this exam. And there will be opportunities to bounce back. Your, you know, I will admit some classes, it is a midterm and an exam, but, or a final exam, but maybe there is one more exam that you can work on, or uh, maybe there are some other smaller assignments or projects that you can really dig into to create a buffer for that midterm that maybe didn't go as well as you wanted it to. Ultimately, though, give yourself something to look forward to after you take your tests. Reward yourself for pushing through. You really do deserve it for all the time and effort you're putting in. But once you're done with that test, put it aside. It's not worth worrying over or sitting in. You will know when you know. And once you know, you do that post-test review and you move on, you learn, and you go from there. Now, I want to highlight self-talk does not have to be overly positive. I'm not saying, you know, you need to convince yourself, I'm the best at everything, but it's about finding that more neutral self-talk, not overly negative, not overly positive, but more in tune with what do you need in this moment. You're not going to know everything on these tests, so just keep doing your best. Think of it like we talked about before, just getting as many points as you can. Focus on that learning process and slowly that pressure should be released. Keep talking yourself through it um, and you hopefully will feel a little bit lighter with that. I'm going to include a really helpful resource in the chat. I have learned a lot from this website. So if you want to check out anything, I would say this is a really, really good one to look at today. But just be mindful of that self-talk, that self-care as you go through these next few weeks with exams. Yeah, and before we wrap up, I also wanted to share a little anecdote I have about pulling all-nighters. I remember um, during my third year of undergrad, I remember very vividly there was this one class that I've been doing really well in, and I was very confident about my knowledge in this class, but, you know, like, I got in over my head, and I ended up pulling an all-nighter to to study for the final because I really wanted to like keep my streak and continue doing well. And because of that, I actually ended up missing a lot of things on the final that I knew before or that I wouldn't have missed otherwise. And um, it was really surprising to me because, you know, like I, in the moment, I didn't realize how much it was affecting me until after I got the exam back and looked at my scores. And I was like, wow, I can't believe like I missed this. Like I definitely knew this. And so definitely like don't underestimate the, um, the importance of sleep and getting rest because, you know, if there are some topics that you can't get, get to, um, it's really difficult to cover all the bases of all the material on the exam, but you also don't want to compromise the things that you study so hard for or that you already do know as well. Um, so that's just another tip that I want to give. 
And so with that, that is all the content that we have for the workshop. Um, like I said earlier, we only had 50 minutes together today, so we couldn't get in everything that there is to know about exam strategies and covering all the different types of exams. But we wanted to leave you all with these resources. Um, I mentioned the study strategies library multiple times throughout this workshop. Um, and so the study strategies library, I'll open up I'll open it up right here, gives a lot of tips and sort of goes into in, into more detail about different strategies and test and techniques for test taking. So we definitely recommend um, checking those out. And this is where you can also sign up for campus tutoring and study sessions as well with the tabs at the top right here. So um, the Academic Skills Center offers both individual and group tutoring for many types um, of classes and different subjects. So we highly recommend signing up to get that specialized help or support for your classes. Um, tutoring is especially popular for classes like chemistry, math, physics that are very grounded in practice problems and sort of like repeating and getting that practice. And that's one type of, type of exam that we couldn't go over today, but I'm sure that you all are encountering. So um, if you need extra help on that, definitely recommend utilizing tutoring and office hours for that so that you can help get customized and specialized support in those subjects. So feel free to take a moment to screenshot um, or save these links. And we do have one more slide after this with a post survey. So please hang tight if you can. Um, like I said, we have a post survey for you to fill out, and this is our first time doing a workshop like this, so we really appreciate any feedback that we can get. Um, so thank you. And is there anything else you want to add, Kara? Take your time with it. If you want to talk through anything that's been specifically challenging, again, your faculty are really great resources, but also the Mustang Success Center. We as advisors know a lot of tips and tricks that can be helpful, and we can talk through any of this with you at any point. So you can always come check in and we can reevaluate what's working, what's not, what do we need to do. But thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it, everyone.